All right, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is where we'll take our text this evening. Romans chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Romans chapter 12, in the first verse, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blessed word. Lord, we thank you that it is living and it speaks to us every day when we look to it. God, give us the mercy and grace to look at it every day and to seek your will. Lord, we thank you for the church. We pray that you would be with us tonight, that you'd manifest this word as it were a living word to those that hear. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, some one uh, somewhat familiar verses uh, of Scripture, uh, Paul writing to the church at Rome. And if you remember, Rome was a mixed church. It had some, time, some Gentile believers, and it had some Jewish believers. Some of the Jews had actually been exiled to Rome, and they had stayed there. And you got to appreciate the book of Romans, and uh, Brother Jarrett's kind of been browbeaten with it, uh, for the last several months, but to understand why the book of Romans is written like it is, you have to understand Roman culture. Now, the Romans were bent on hating our God. Now, they had a few of their own they were okay with, uh, but that very society that Paul was writing to, and he even warns it in chapter 1, had a tendency and a bent to sexual immorality, including sodomy, sodomites. And that was their culture. And in Romans 1, he lays out what the concern would be in the future for these people, and he was right on line. The, the, the Roman culture, the Roman uh, society, as Paul wrote it to it, is no more. It completely collapsed because of immorality. And so as they were believers and Paul already seeing the trouble in the way, he begins to warn them how to fight this, how to be ready. And Christians today, uh, I would say by and large, they're not ready. Uh, when the, uh, when the uh, uh, problem comes, we're not prepared to deal with it. When the attack is upon us, we don't know what to do or where to go. Now, we as the Lord's people, we ought to be prepared because I assure you most assuredly the attack is coming. If you're saved, the attack is on the way. And if you're lost, hey, he's where you want, he's, you're where he wants you to be. So he ain't going to waste time with you. But for the redeemed, and that is who Paul is writing for, uh, it is a risk for believers. Now, he begins, I beseech you, or I beg you, listen to me. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, again, he's not writing to the lost. He, uh, he says, brethren. Now, that doesn't leave, leave the ladies out. That was just to, uh, I, I like to read old paper columns uh, in the historical society. And in those things, Donna would never have been referred to as Donna Lafferty, but she would have been referred to as Mrs. Larry Lafferty. And I still remember when that happened, when people did not really say the woman's first name. So when it says that, it's addressing the church as a group, not just the men of the church. And he, he writes to them and uh, addresses redeemed people specifically. Then he says... <clears throat> By the mercies of God. You know what makes truth real to you? The mercy of God. 
When, when you think about down through the years and how God's revealed himself to you more and more and more through the word of God, you know how that growth happens? By the mercy of God. And you see other individuals maybe saved along the same time as you are, and they're right where they got started. And it's easy to criticize them. Well, they don't study enough. They don't attend church nothing. Uh, enough. Well, when you boil the water off, it's this. You know what you know by the mercy of God. Mm -hmm. And that's that plus nothing, minus nothing. And, and, and that's what Paul was saying. If you get this truth, if you understand this truth, it's by the mercy of God. And on the flip side of it, and this is the dangerous thing, and we know from the history of the church at Rome, it's exactly what did happen. Uh, if the mercy's not there, you're going to fall for the other. You're going to believe the flip side to this. So he, he, uh, he begs them essentially in the name of the Almighty that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now, the Jewish believers that uh, made up this church, and again, it's a mixed multitude, they did this, that was for them, because they knew all about the Jewish sacrifices. They knew how they were to be done, they knew what was to be sacrificed, they knew when it was to be sacrificed, and he says, you forget about all the doves, and you forget about the lambs, and you forget about uh, the cows, because now you are the sacrifice. Now, the atonement was by Christ. Us living for him is us. You know, don't blame your sin on God. He cleansed you from your sin. He cleansed you from the penalty of your sin. And I don't believe that we are a free will people. If I did, if I believed that, I'd have free will badness over the door. But we're not, but we are a free agent. In other words, the money that I earn at work, I do what I want to with it, right? It's mine. I'm its agent. And when he saved your soul, what you do next, not only is it up to you, but you're responsible for it. And, and you know, I think we understand and we're, we're like, woo-hoo, uh, we do what we want to do. Well, just remember, when, when you have that mentality, you're responsible for it as well. And we've raised up a whole generation that will not take ownership of their own actions. Uh, Sister Hannah's about to shout. She deals with them every day, right? And, and that, is, that is what we're dealing with. These people are being adults. You know what? I paid off my student debt. I don't want to take on someone else's. I've got mine paid off, right? And uh, when, when they think the government's going to do it, you know who's really going to do it? Me and you. We're, we're going to pay the debt back because the government has no money in and of itself. They get it from us. Amen. That's right. And, and, and so we see that when you take on the, this responsibility, use it carefully. You know what? Your life is going to speed, speed by so quickly you won't even realize it. Yeah. We have very few good, healthy years to dedicate to his name. Mm -hmm. And then you start having little aches and pains. Mm -hmm. Saw something on Facebook that says, uh, enjoy your 20s and 30s and 40s because in the 50s that check engine light's going to come on. And I have found that to be true. And, and, and so we see that Paul was giving them responsibility or pointing out the responsibility that this temple, that's what he told the Jews in Hebrews, is because they understood the temple. They say, this is your temple. It has to be maintained just like the temple at Jerusalem. And he reminds them of that. So present your body a living sacrifice. Right. Holy. Now, we don't hear a lot about that name, uh, word anymore because the holiness Pentecostal people have about taken it from us. But you know what? Holy is a good word. Holy means set apart. Mm -hmm. Holy means dedicated. Dedicated to God. Holy is needful today. 
I mean, I dare to say, and I think we could agree on this, by and large, if you go around traveling even a little way, our churches like, lack power today. They really do. And I can tell you exactly why they lack power. It's because they lack holiness. The two come together. And without one, you won't have the other. See church doors closing? You know what? It's amazing what we want to blame the sovereignty of God for, isn't it? Mm. Well, that church closed. It was just God's will. Was it? I don't know. Probably the people quit. Probably the people were no longer standing. Probably things got very, very cold. And then it closed. It doesn't just happen like that. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and so Paul says, you use what you have to be holy. You use what you, be, you have to be different. Then he says, acceptable unto God. Now, only you can answer this for yourself, but the things you do on a daily basis, are they acceptable? It doesn't have to be brandish. It doesn't have to be uh, beautiful diamonds in a spiritual sense. Just acceptable things. You know, you know what's just acceptable? Getting down to the house of God. That's just reasonable. Acceptable. Uh, you know, you will expect some of this just because we arrive at the front door of the church building. That's just acceptable. It's reasonable. It, it, it's all to be asked. When, when we give our tithe on, on the increase that God has given us. You know what? That's not banner news. That's acceptable. That's right. And if you want to give offering, that's between you and the Lord. But before that, just acceptable. It's just reasonable. It's just right. And we live in a day and age today where the, the most minuscule of service is applauded. It, it, it is, and here we find he begins to outline some things, and then I love the next verse, which is your reasonable. Reasonable. Now, ladies, this is this is y'all. Uh, go down here to Frank's, especially with the way money is right now. You look, you look at something that's reasonable, right? Now. Reasonable, you have to look at two things. The quality of what you're buying and the amount of money you're spending on it. Now, if you get, uh, if, if you get tomatoes for 10 cents a piece, but they stink, that's not reasonable. I mean, uh, they're just wanting them out of the store, right? But if you get a decent tomato, maybe it's been around a day or two, and it's 50 cents a piece, you say, you know what, that's reasonable. We can, we can do that. that. You're getting a decent, uh, decent vegetable at a decent price. That's reasonable. So when we serve the Lord in the way that we're supposed to, it's not this. It's reasonable. It's reasonable. It, and, and, and I'm not saying we buy our salvation. I don't mean to suggest that at all. But it's fair. You know what I'm saying? It, it's just right. And, and so Paul begins this letter to the church at Rome. Is listen, you need to serve him more, and that's just a reasonable request. That's just an average thing to expect of the Lord's New Testament churches. Verse 2, and be not, trans, be not conformed to this world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to notice a few things here. And really, our emphasis is transformation. Now, let me say, first of all, that has nothing to do with salvation. Transformation is change. Now, when my little boys were little, y'all remember the Transformers. They had to have every one of them. And if uh, me and Donna didn't get them somehow, it was child abuse. And, but they look one way when the kids would do this, and then they do this, and it would look totally different. And not only did it look totally different, 
they moved different. Sometimes it was four wheels, sometimes it was two wheels, sometimes they had arms, sometimes they didn't have arms. Uh, it was a transformation. And that's what God expects from us. He saved you to be changed. Not to look like the world, not to act like the world, not to be like the world, but to be different. And he says, so I want you transformed. I don't want you to be like this world. I don't want you to look like this world. And then he even gives us the means to do it by the renewing of your mind. Yeah, there you go. And it does say mind. That does mean brain. It doesn't mean the spirit. It doesn't mean the soul of man. It does mean uh, your noggin. And that is how we get spiritual information. And the Lord can enlighten you that way. But it starts up here. How many times, how much time of the day do you spend here? And I'll be honest, I probably spend at least two hours a day in front of this stupid thing. And you think AT&T thinks that's reasonable? They probably do. You think Google likes it? I bet they do. You think Facebook likes it? Oh, I know they do. Right? A hundred years from now, you know what that's going to be? I have to constantly remind myself, a complete waste of time. Right? And, and so, that's renewing my mind for, with something. If I, know, if I see a term and I'm not sure what it means, I look it up on Google, right? If it's a term, a biblical term, I've done myself a good service. If it's what's the most popular color uh, that women like in their front room, that is a waste of time. You see what I'm saying? So are, are we being reasonable are we, are we being zealous? Were we transformed in salvation? The best measure of redemption, Brother Downs used to teach me this and finally got it through my head, don't look at their profession, look 20 years down the road. If they're still hanging in there, if they still love the Lord, if they're still attending a sound church, you know what? You can pretty much die and be at peace with that. But, if they're at some kind of modern, sounds like an 80s rock concert, listen, I don't, have any, I don't have any confidence in that. You say, well, you're being judgmental. No, the Bible says this. Ye are in the world. This was Christ's own ministry. Ye are in the world, not of the world. And, and that is exactly where we as the Lord's people need to abide in the days that we live as we're being, as, as the devil's attempting to suck the spiritual life out of us and replace it with something rancid and pure and, and putrefying. We need to renew our minds. You know what people go astray? They don't renew their minds. Let me just ask you this. If a Church of Christ person came to you tonight, could you defend your faith? Could you say, this is why I believe in grace? This is why I believe in experiential salvation? What about the, the big new one that's hitting the Lord's churches? What do you know about the church? Is it universal? Are they singular? If you believe they're individual and singular like I do, how do you find that? See, if you spend more time in the book and you renew your minds with these truths that you've known since a young person, they'll stay with you. And if you don't renew your minds, you know what? Because we are carnal, we're going to lose them. We won't know where to begin. We won't know what to say. We won't know uh, how to defend the truth that God has given us. Be you not conformed to this world. You know, the Bible says a picture's worth a thousand. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. The Bible does not say that. <laughs> I say a picture is worth a thousand words. How do you look? What would a picture of you look like? Now, I've been back at the nursing home, believe it or not, already nine months. And when I go there, 
after church or I go there, uh, just run in. Sometimes Bella wants to go see her friends over there. Um, I think it's pretty awesome that 11 year old girl has friends that are in the nursing home. <laughs> and uh, they will immediately say, and I, I finally got most of the employees, are you Mennonite? And I'm like, well, no, I'm not Mennonite. I have no hips, and I need my britches to stay up. You know what I'm saying? But you know what? This is, this is, this is the oomph of that. You know what? They know what a Mennonite looks like, don't they? Mm -hmm. And I guess most of the time I look like one. They know Mennonites usually have beards. All Mennonites I know, if they're married, they'll have a beard. It says something. Walking around, I'm dead. You know, I don't want to be uh, one of those individuals that you can't tell if they're male or female. You know what the Bible says? I created them male and female. We, the, the, this gender, gen, gender neutral stuff is crazy. It's right out of the pits of hell. Mm -hmm. How did we get there? Well, I'll tell you, it's about an 85 year old process, but we're here, right? You know what it started with? World War II. For the women to be safe, when they're in the, and when they're in the defense factory, they need to wear fire bridges. That's how it started. Well, oh, Brother Larry, I don't know about that. I do. See, I've seen the pictures that date back before then. And you know what all the ladies had on in those pictures? Dresses. And you know what all the men had on? Britches. Right? Mm -hmm. Amen or oh me? So we see then, we need to put these things back in our mind. We have lost them somewhere. We have not. And, and all again, what did the Bible say? What did the Lord Jesus Christ quote it say? It's a reasonable service. Right. Amen. It's not notorious. You know, uh, Dad had a medal from his uh, first tour in Vietnam. And you know what? It wasn't because he was there shooting at the North Vietnamese. He saved people's life. That was notorious. Shooting other, the, the North Vietnamese, you know what? That's why he was there. That was just reasonable. But saving his friends was above and beyond. You see what I'm saying? And, and so we see when we think about this, it, and it impacts our life, and it's going to change our life, and it's going it, it's to make a difference in what we do. It either causes you to rejoice or it makes you mad. And you know what? When I first heard these things, it made me mad. It really did. Years ago, I wore short britches. I saw it work when I saw from the Word of God that modest apparel was my reasonable service. You know what? That was over 35 years ago, and I haven't had a pair since. And you know, I am not saying again, Woo, Brother Larry, you're right on. No, no, no. Reasonable. Reasonable. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh, what, what we sometimes conceive as notorious is just what's expected of a believer. And so we see that he, uh, he says, I don't want you to be like the world. I want you to be transformed. And that is with this dear book by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect, that word means complete, will of God. Mm -hmm. What is the will of God? You ever thought about that? Now we certainly know he gives us the sermon, I mean, excuse me, he, give, he commissions the church uh, uh, just before his ascension, it says, Go ye into all the world and teach the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you know what? That was to his church. Who was he talking to here? Individuals like me, and like you, and like you, and like you. 
Paul is writing, remember what does it say? To the brethren, mm -hmm. to individuals. He, he wasn't writing to the big church in the sky. He was talking to individuals. So it gets down really to this. What do you think of the man, uh, of the king, of the God, uh, the peace of the Godhead, Jesus Christ? Because what you perceive that to be will direct your actions. That I have found to be true after 35, 30 years of ministry. Verse 3, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now it gets down kind of to where we live. And he said, I beseech you by grace. Do you remember when you didn't know the truth that you know today? Do you know why you know the truth that you do know? Grace. He so said, I beseech you by the grace of God. Now, this, this, is, this is the kicker. Don't criticize other people. You know what? It's just like I said. They might not be as advanced as you. Right. Amen. I never even heard of election. I thought election was something that you had in August of every year. You see what I'm saying? Somebody, just because somebody doesn't understand predestination, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to help them. I, I'm not going to criticize them. I'm not going to run them down. Not my place to do that. You know what? There's a boy. I saw him, you know, the, the young man that preached our meeting back in the fall. He and I were coughing down at here. And um, there's a, a Native American man that is in their church. He has hair down to here. And you know what my advice to, to him was? Give him time. Just give him time. You don't have to browbeat that subject. If he asks you why, flip over in 1 Corinthians 11 and say, hey, this is why. And don't, and don't, you don't have to be mean about it. I think the other side to that, and while the Lord's churches are aging and our young people are leaving, we don't do it with a heart of love. Right. We do it because we're angry. You, you know what? You know what all the changes in my life have been about? Bible calls it this, being convinced of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. I heard Sean Prescott, and this is hysterical to me because Sean is hair challenged. He said, as soon as I turned 18, I was going to grow my hair down my back. And he said, then I joined the army. Because see, his, his daddy... His daddy would come by, and if he was touching his collar, his daddy would cut it himself. And I don't know if y'all have ever met Brother Sean's daddy. He's a good preacher, brother, but I wouldn't want him cutting my hair. See what I'm saying? Was that the right way to teach that? A couple different ways that you could look at that. Number one, it was his daddy's house, and what his daddy said went. And I, I, that is how I raised my children, and it is still how I raise my children. But the flip side, he said, Sean, this is why we do it this way. We need biblical teaching, don't we? We need our children not to just... See, because if all it is is because I said so, as soon as they're gone, they'll do whatever they want to do. That has been my full understanding <laughs> with my, my own children, my nieces, my nephews. That's what I have seen consistently. You know who can convince you of truth? The Holy Ghost. You know who can't? Everybody else. But, and, and so we see then, as Paul is reminding the Romans about these truths, he says, you be graceful, you be mindful, you, you, you take compassion in what you're saying, and that is the ultimate advice here. Not to think more highly uh, they ought to think, but so think soberly according to God have dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, Notice that word there, 
says measure of faith, not the faith. The, the faith is the oracles of God handed down by the Lord God Almighty and Jesus Christ to his people. That is the faith, a set of oracles. Faith, the confidence you have, right? How much, how much assurance you put into something. I believe that book is the full word of God. I believe what it says, it means. You know how I came to that conclusion? Years and years of teaching grew my faith. And when I say teaching, I don't mean me teaching. I mean me sitting there and being taught to. That's how it grows. And you know what? We can't grow that anywhere but one of the Lord's true churches. Because you know why? The other bunch, they might be right on half of it. But what about the other half? You know, you know what a half pie that's poisoned and a half pie that's okay? You know what you have? You have a poisoned pie either way, right? Which piece are you going to grab? See, the reality is we don't know which one, do we? Right. So we need, uh, if we believe and we crave this truth with our mind and with our mind's understanding, you have to get in this book and you have to be in one of the Lord's churches. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, meaning the individual members of the church at Rome, and, and all our members, members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and every member and every one members of one of another. Now, what, what, is, what is that saying? Well, first of all, I want you to see that it's addressing a singular church, the church at Rome, right? What does the book of Galatians address? A number of churches, as far as we know, right? The church is of Galatia. Peter's epistles, they were all the churches that they could find. This one, remember all the way in the beginning when Jared taught, began his lessons to the church of God, which be at Rome. So if he's saying all this, your members in particular, the body has a number of members. He was just talking to the church at Rome. He wasn't talking to everyone. He, he, he had been assisted and organized many, many churches, and he addressed this one thing to the church at Rome. You know what that means? That means we are individual. And, you know, we don't need the same message at New Testament as they need at Faith at Clarksville. And Faith at Clarksville don't need the same message that the Northside Baptist Church needs over at Elkton, right? What if I'm your nurse and I give you all the same pill? Y'all cool with that? I don't think it would work, do you? What I found, if you want to do it, do that, it will help some, it will do nothing for some, and, and it will hurt some. So that's not God's design. It was a singular church at Rome that had very specific problems. It was a mixed church, both Greek and Jewish people, and they had their own special set of needs that the Lord God did address. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophesy or preaching, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. Again, I want you to see it's not the faith of faith. Your faith grows with time. Or ministry, let us wait on ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. What is a ministry? Well, it's whatever God sets you to. You ever think about the ladies? And I, I, I know Brother Jody can cook, but I can't. You don't want me to cook. Right? The ladies prepare a great meal every Lord's Day. You know what that is, ladies? That's a ministry. Are you preaching? No. Is it a ministry? Absolutely. You see what I'm saying? 
But since I can't cook, that cannot be my ministry. Does that make sense? I can preach. That's one of my ministries. Parenting is most definitely an ignored ministry in 2024. Now, I'll have to say this, and I'll brag on my own people. This church is different. I've seen some excellent parenting, and that's just by observation. But you know, you know what, you know what you do well at the things you deem important, All right? So as we think about this, that this whole thing, uh, all that he had given the church here at Rome tonight, when you go to bed. I want you to pray and think about what's reasonable. And I want you to think and pray that you need to be transformed. Maybe you forgot why that is so. Maybe you forgot why that one thing is needful. Search the scriptures. It's not for me to tell I can point you to the scriptures. I'll be glad to do it. But who grows you in grace? It's not me. It's Father. And so look for yourselves. You know what? Uh, and and uh, this is one of the Campbellites' favorite verses. Work out your own salvation. And that is in the Bible, absolutely. You got a garden? Whose responsibility is to work it out? Me and Don have one. She does more in the garden than I do. But you know what, Brother Junior, don't come over and work out in our garden. Brother Jody, Sister Dina, they live on the other side of the river. We don't run down there and pull the corn out. You know why? Because it belongs to them. And even further, unless they just told me, I have no, I don't know, have no reason to know, don't, don't have any ability to know if the weeds are knee high in there. That's their garden. You see what I'm saying? Work out your salvation. It doesn't mean you're working for your salvation. It means you're taking care of what you have. And that's why these rich yeah. truths, people don't even know them anymore. And that is why. And anybody ever have a garden? And me, Don's had a couple of these, especially when I was young in the ministry and everybody wanted to hear me and going, 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 going. We had a couple of gardens at least that we lost all together. It, it, I mean, you couldn't get into them, literally. You know what we had to do? Get the mower and just go boom. And you know what? When we were mowing the garden down, we didn't find any fruit. We didn't find tomatoes. We didn't find beans. You know what we found? Dead plants and weeds. Now, what was the reason for that? We didn't work it out. Now, it's easy to say, we didn't have time. And we didn't. But on the same token, could we have made time? Do you make time for your, your spiritual self? That's what it really gets down to, is it not? Do you make time for your spiritual self? Give yourself some attention. 